everybody. Welcome, welcome to this LinkedIn Live. Happy September. Happy back to school. Happy back to whatever you were doing before the summer doldrums. Uh, my guest is Jeffrey Moore, a very good friend, somebody I've looked up to for many, many years. Many of you will know him for his early groundbreaking work on Crossing the Chasm. I'm particularly taken with one of his more recent books, Zone to Win, Note Branding. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the state of corporate innovation, how big companies can learn to do new things, and kind of whatever else is on his mind. So, Jeffrey, welcome. Well, thank you for having me, Rita. It's a delight to be here with you. <laughs> it's always a fun time to have a conversation. Isn't it, it is indeed. <laughs> September, we're starting the fall. Right? Yes. Great things. Um, and by the way, uh, those of you who were asleep walking, the fourth quarter is like a few days away. I'm just, just, just saying, if you wanted to accomplish anything in 2023, now would be a really good time to start getting on with it. <laughs> So our sort of, I guess, the question both of us have been puzzling over for a while is, um, you know, why is it that companies struggle so much with getting this balance right between doing whatever it is they're doing today, which they have to do because that, that's what earns all the money for their collective enterprises, and doing um, what they need to do to ensure the future. And one of your, I think, ahas, this is a book, it's a few years old by now, it's called Zone to Win, but you really talk about the perverse incentives that are in place in bits of the organization that are designed to do different things. So I thought maybe just give people an overview of that core idea. Yeah, I mean, the idea, this was done with the team at Microsoft under Satya Nadella and the team at Salesforce with Mark Benioff. So two world-class teams. I mean, this is not, we weren't dealing with the injured, right? We were dealing with pretty pro athletes. But what you see is there are these zones of operation inside of any large corporation which have their own operating model. And for that zone, that operating model is designed for success and it works really well. But there are four different zones and each zone has a different operating model. And the operating model that creates success in that zone creates failure in the other three. And, and it, 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 you know, when you sort of parse it out that way, people say they kind of get it. But the problem is when we come into our meeting, we bring our own zones operating model with us and all our muscle memory is instincts are to use our metrics and our, and our approach. And so what was happening was the following things. Because the performance zone made the money this quarter, they were kind of the top dog. And their belief was, you know, if you just paid people for performance, every one of these zones would work better. You should use our model. You know, you should pay HR people on hiring performance and you should pay finance people on finance performance. And so that was their, their model. And then the productivity zone, we call it the productivity zone, which is all the shared services behind the scenes. They have a process model. It's, you know, this, we run finance with a process. We run IT with a process. We run HR with a process. If these guys in the performance zone would just follow the process, we'd be fine, right? And, and so both of them are doing that stuff. And then the, the incubation zone was the third zone. And the incubation zone, the performance zone looked at it and went, well, there's no money there. Why don't you give me the, that money? I'll have, add more headcount. So why are you even spending money there? But if you have to manage it, give it to the productivity zone. They'll manage the incubation zone. So the productivity zone says, sure, we can do that. We have a process model. So they bring the process model out to manage the incubation zone. Well, you know, you and I have been around venture capital for 40 years. There is a great operating model for managing, developing disruptive innovations. It's called the venture capital operating model, not their financial model, their operating model. It's great. Milestone-based funding, entrepreneurial, small business units, bing, 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 bing. That was not the pro the, the, the productivity so said, no, no, we want to have an ideation event, then we want to have this funnel, and then we'll have stage gates, and we'll work. It'll be very democratic. It'll be wonderful. And so, the, and then the fourth zone, which is the transformation zone, which is the only zone that's not populated all the time. In fact, ideally, it's populated infrequently. But that's when you really have to change dramatic gear. And the thing, the thing that was there that was was hard was the CEO would say, well, I've got two or three ways of horses to ride here because the world is changing. We have to adapt, but I don't know which one to pick. So I'm going to run all three of them and whichever one wins, that's the one we'll follow. And it turns out that the, the, a transformation can be only one way, the highway. This is what Steve Jobs you know, said. There's only one thing we do at Apple. You just got to get that thing all the way across the tipping point. So the point was four different models. None of them are like, I've never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. But but all of them need their own sequestered respect, and the zones have to respect each other, and we weren't really doing that. 
Well, and I think it's, a, I mean, I, I have those conversations all the time and, and you know, the, 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 the performance people, you know, coming in and going, well, where, where are your KPIs and, and how much did you deliver and what's your, you know, what are your deliverables? And the incubation people are going, but I have to tell you about this cool thing I learned. <laughs> It's just okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay, so but you bring up a really important point, which is, and I and I do spend a ton of time in the incubation zone because that's the place where people are, are feeling the most struggling right now. Mm -hmm. The incubation zone has to have an accountability model. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what the venture, the venture. I mean, nobody ever said venture capitalists didn't demand accountability, mm -hmm. but it's accountability to milestones that are proven in the market, mm -hmm. and not phase gates, and not learning. And, 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 and fast failing is like only the game in the incubation zone is win or learn. And, and, and by the way, don't learn the same thing twice. Right. <laughs> so, but those are those are the kinds of things that you can implement if you put in place a governance model mm -hmm. for the incubation zone that thinks that way and not a process model. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I've long been fascinated by is these four massive corporate activities that fight with each other. So you've got your strategy process, right? And when it's done right, and you've written about this pages and pages and pages about, you know, when strategy is done right, it's pulling you into the future. You know, it's, I mean, you wrote a great, oh, in dealing with Darwin, you had this whole story about how Cisco had managed kind of figuring out what their future would be. So strategy, when it's done right, it's future oriented. Then you've got your budget process. And a lot of times budget, like where does this year's budget start? It starts with last year's budget. <laughs> You know, so budgeting's got you anchored firmly in the past. Then you have the governance process, and people doing that sometimes aren't connected to strategy, and they're not connected to budgets. It's like yeah. there's somebody's pet bunny in there from like two CEOs ago, and why are we still doing this? Nobody ever asks. And then you've got what people believe is going to get them ahead, and I think that's very intimately connected to how they interpret success in each of the zones. So, you know, you've got some performance zone person asked to function in an incubation arena and they're just lost. They're completely yeah. lost. <laughs> yeah. I, I think what you, and by the way, so, and by the way, we're human beings. So, so, so we, we tend to be local to ourselves. And I mean, you know, I don't think people change after the age of five. So basically, <laughs> I don't think we're going to reform people. Okay. <laughs> so, so, but I do think what you can do is say, look, I, I think there are two, you have to externalize. The, the focus. And I think there's been two modalities that I've been, so you and I both seen successful in, and I spend most of my time, as you know, in the tech sector. So this is particularly true in the tech sector. Either you are going to be motivated by the competition, and that would be a Microsoft, Intel, Cisco, Sun kind of play, or you're going to be motivated by your customer, in which case it's an HP, Salesforce, Nokia style play. But either way, it's not about you. Because because the four zones, you, you can't say I will I will subordinate myself to one of the other three zones because they go no I, no 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 I'm the most important zone. Uh, but if you say but I can subordinate myself in service to a higher cause, serving our customer or beating the competition or the two that come through, and I think I think that's what we have to continually as leaders redirect the attention of our corporation. Like right now, just getting back to the office. Yeah, it's not about you. Remember, it's about our customer or it's. Yeah, going forward. So well, and that gets to this fascinating model that both of us like, which is the Schneider model for cultures, right? Yeah. So you've got yeah. these cultivation cultures where it's all about living the dream, and these collaboration cultures, which as you said, it's all about serving the customer, competence cultures where it's like winning, you know, and beating the competition. And then the one that has gone out of favor a little bit, but still has a lot of sway is um, you know, the the control, control culture. culture. Like, follow the plan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, you know, and, 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 and the truth is, there's a kind of a natural fit with the cultures and the zones. It's not, it's not a perfect, but but it, but it, but it's pretty close. And, and the one that I'm most interested in is this collaboration culture because it has come to the fore and become. It is, I think, for the generation that came after me and the generation after that. I'm old enough now to have multiple generations. I think collaboration is becoming increasingly the modality. For example, when I went to school. Collaboration was called cheating, and you were expelled. <laughs> you were, no, but it's true. Okay, and when my kids went to school, they sat at a table and they were supposed to collaborate. Okay, so we have collaboration cultures, but the problem with collaboration cultures, or there's a number of them, but there's two big problems. One is they invite everybody to every meeting, and they feel like everybody has a participatory role in every decision, which is wrong. There's, so there's a fix for that problem. And then the second one is they are reluctant to hold each other accountable to anything because they associate accountability with blaming. 
And blaming is bullshit. I mean, bl blaming is not something anybody, that, that's not constructive. But accountability is incredibly important because if you're not accountable, you have no power. You can't do anything in the world. So you got to be accountable, but you have to figure out the right way to be accountable. And that, and, and so that, that's, a, that those are, that I'm spending, when I spend time on culture, that those are the two issues I'm spending time on. Very interesting. Well, we've been talking about, um, you know, years ago, right? It was a bureaucracy that was the dominant model. It was IBM, you know, you couldn't ever have a meeting with one person at IBM. It was always like, you know, a phalanx of 10 or 12. <laughs> it was a machine bureaucracy and functioned very well. General Electric, same thing, right? And you couldn't have a meeting without an overhead projector and foils. Oh, but yes. the oil was the IBM word for transparency, right? <laughs> and, and, and Lou Gerstner has this story he tells where he came in and he's he's interviewing all his top executives and they start to bring out the over a projector and he just turns it off. He says, no, 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 tell me about your business. Uh -huh. so that, that, was, that was the deconstructing of a bureaucratic artifact that had in its time. It was great. It was a military. It was a military model. There was a time for it. Yeah, I mean, we put a man on the moon with that model. I mean, come on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But but uh, but. You know. Well, and back in the day when everything was vertically integrated and every you know you owned the complete sort of uh, set of layers of technology and everything had to work together. I mean, that ultimately was what saved IBM. It's that yeah. Gerson realized instead of breaking the company up, they actually had all this stuff where they could take other people's messes and confusion and, and integrate it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that was a huge breakthrough. Well, and, and he put it, he put, he, uh, what I think he did for the saved IBM was he put it back in service to the customer. Mm -hmm. What happened to those bureauc bureaucratic models, it ended up being in service to the institution. And, and, and then, and then you get a, a class of organization, man, remember that book way back in the day, which is I'm playing the game because I'm climbing the ladder. Cause this is how, this is how business works. Exactly. And it was became internally focused and, and, and it became, you know, not serviceable for society. And totally. so totally, I mean, yeah. I remember doing a bit of work with IBM at the time and you'd have 50 people in a room. I mean, first of all, that's a problem. 50 people. And what are they going to do with 50 people in a room? But the conversation, if I had to break it down into like a percentage chunk, it was 98% stuff about IBM and maybe 2% about what was going yeah. on in the rest of the world. Yeah. 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 Really I, I find that um, hierarchies to stacks, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this, and the stat, boy, that was fascinating. So in the nineties, the whole open source architecture. So all of a sudden, and what had happened was, so deck was competing with sun at the time, for example, in workstations and mentor graphics was buying workstations from both, from both companies. And mentor told me, Every single deck computer arrived dead on arrival. It, because, and the problem was there'd be something here or something there or whatever. And if anything in that computer broke, it didn't work. But, 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 but the thing about the Sun model was, hey, if that disk drive doesn't work, you can put in this other disk drive. That operating system would put in this other operating. And so we built this ecosystem around the Cisco router and the Microsoft, you know, the Intel chip and the Microsoft operating system and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. And that at that point, bureaucracy doesn't work because you're not vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. That became one of let Darwinian. It was literally a Darwinian survival of the fittest. This is where the performance zones really took over. Mm -hmm. And and if you look at the winners at that time, they were all just like Velociraptor you know, kind of companies. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> But but they were amazingly amazingly competitive, mm -hmm. and 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 we grew on that uh, until that then kind of fell apart because we were we were sub optimizing. It was, we had we created all the basically we created a world of silos, mm -hmm. and 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 then that wouldn't work, and that's when that led to the collaboration, mm -hmm. which is collaboration culture. I don't yeah. think I've ever seen now. And now what I'm playing around with is this concept I'm calling the permissionless organization, which is that you can conceive of a world in which tech and having sensors on everything and having things instrumented can actually help people self-manage. So you, you can do away with a lot of what managers used to do. Um, and I'm not sure yet exactly what that looks like, but we're seeing a lot of early signs that they make decisions faster, they can push decision rights closer to the edge of the organization, they can move a lot faster, they can learn a lot faster. Um, now, I think they're tough places to work. <laughs> You know, it's interesting what's happening. I think what's happening is, if you, I think I associate also with the remote work phenomenon. Mm -hmm. where basically, we all kind of became de facto contractors because we weren't going to the office. So we, so this notion that we we're part of a, you know, some larger organization. I mean, yes, we were 
on paper, but in reality, we were all sitting in, in our own offices. <laughs> and, so, and, and we were getting our feedback digitally, right? I mean, the, you know, that's how, so, so then the notion of, well, first of all, I can get my feedback from Zoom from you, but then if you tell me, well, Jeff, actually, if you just would look at the chart, you could look at the chart, you don't have to have me read you the chart. And so all of a sudden we come on self-navigating. Mm -hmm. And I think the digital transformation in part is about an, a, an individual empowerment. The danger for me is, I think what it does is it harvests our existing abilities. Mm -hmm. I don't think it invests in our future abilities. Mm -hmm. And so I were, the reason I want people to come back to the office is because I, the mentoring, the, the cross-connecting, the, the, the next generation of sort of human development, that's the piece I worry about missing. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. And I should uh, tell our listeners, um, Jeff has fabulous um, articles on LinkedIn that he publishes on a regular basis. And there's a really good one about, you know, let's be very clear. Like, if you know your stuff, if you know what you're doing, if it's a question of like, well, my, it's writing a book chapter, okay? I don't do that by committee. I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write it, and I'll begin, middle, end, done. Um, but if I'm trying to figure out what to write the next book chapter about, and I could use input from intelligent colleagues and friends, um, that would be, that would be amazing right and yeah. uh and and you don't do that sitting in a room by yourself you don't and the other piece i think you miss is uh, i found myself of course you know it's, you get to a certain age and you, sort of, you repeat yourself a lot so just be careful of that mm -hmm. but but this one is like i keep on using the phrase being in service to mm -hmm. and for me being in service to orients gets all my best talents is in the in kind of in the right orientation when you're working alone with just cyber feedback you're not in service you're in service to your own income you're, you're, I get you're in service to your family. You're paying for your house or whatever, but it's it's hard. It's possible, but it's hard to be in service to something outside of yourself. And man, if you want the world to support you and you want you want to be successful, the world's got to align with you. And the world aligns around people who are in service to things that the other people in the world also want to get furthered. And so that notion of building that that community of service to any outcome. You know, global warming, education, you know, making a gazillion dollars. I don't care what it is, but, but we align together as human beings. Mm -hmm. That that humanity piece of it, we got to be careful with that one. So I, just want, I don't want to lose sight. I, it, it's only one ingredient, but it's, to me it's a big ingredient. Oh, I think it's huge. I think it's huge. I mean, I look at the younger people, and, um, and there's actually been some evidence on this, the, you know, startups where everybody's together are statistically they grow a lot faster than startups where people are sort of navigating being apart. And I, I believe there's real reasons for that. Oh, we do have a question. Uh, Susan Hasty, love to hear your thoughts on win-win negotiations. Are building negotiation capabilities important in expanding value and innovation? What factors or constraints may inhibit learning and training? And that's interesting. Well, do you want, I, you want to go first? I'll go well, first. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, for me, I think the 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 win-win negotiation thing has to start again. Well, I'll go back to being in service too. So, because if it, otherwise, if if you and I are negotiating and basically it, it's a let's suppose it's a zero-sum game, that's hard to create a win-win. But if you're saying, look, you and I are both aligned around a third party having a better outcome than they have today, now let's negotiate and let's use the third party's outcome as our arbiter of how to redistribute, you know, resources, like the budgeting thing that you were talking about earlier, you know, in that, in that fighting time, boy, your biggest competitor at Microsoft was another person at Microsoft. Yeah. Oh, it was, yeah. It was just totally like, like, like that. But in a collaboration culture, it's more about, and you know, we, we got to make sure that the dollar does something in the world. The way collaboration cultures go south, is they actually collaborate and they share money, but they spend it on themselves. Mm. <laughs> and so it's not like, it's like, oh, well, you know, it's all very happy. And it is. We're all very happy together, but we're not doing much in the world. So yeah. What do you think about win-win negotiation? Um, what do I think about? Um, yeah, I would agree. I think that, um, I think the, the most powerful thing is the willingness to walk away. I mean, you know, this is a situation where for you, this is an existential thing you know that you urgently need you have you have to figure out some way that you're not um, dependent if there's wiggle room i mean if it's a sort of an i can give a little you can give a little there's there's it's not an existential crisis it's not a must win kind of thing um then i really like the idea of saying in service to some third party or greater goal or greater you know 
purpose. Um, and I, I love the way that you framed this idea of purpose because it's gotten very woo-woo in the last what, I don't know, year or two in my view. <laughs> We've got everybody running around talking about purpose and you know all this. But I think it really is, you know, are you serving a customer? Are you dealing with a competitor? Are you uncovering something new and challenging and exciting? You know, what is your thing? And I remember asking um, Dick Rimmel about this, a bit, about what did he think about purpose? And it turns out he, I think where he went to work right at a college was the Jet Propulsion Laboratory or something. And he said, well, you know, my purpose was to learn as much as I could at the most exciting place I thought I could get to. And that's that's a purpose, right? That's a, that's a service to a greater good. Yeah. Um, and I think that works fine. And I think sometimes we get ourselves all tied up in this idea of purpose that it's got to involve the environment or saving the trees. No, or yeah, no, no. <laughs> no I, I think we, the, but I think it's a really interesting question. I'm going to do. Uh, uh, there's a university out in the West called Stanford. I don't know if you've heard of it. I've heard, I've heard, yeah, I've heard. I, I think it, it's it's a startup. It's it's kind of getting going. <laughs> anyway, so it it's doing a thing with the Santa Clara County uh, leadership whatever. And so I'm, and so I'm, they've asked me to give a, a little chat to it. And I was thinking about that. And one of the things I realized, you know, think about government, government's kind of like the productivity zone for society, right? It's, it's where we try to run our processes and keep things going. And I was saying, you know, the danger in that your world is you, you you're, the people that work for you may think, well, I'm selling my time to Santa Clara County and I walk the line for the lineman or I, you know, I, I do, I'm a policeman or I'm a whatever. And the answer is not really. The, the world wants to buy outcomes. And so this word, I'm trying to take this word because some people have been using the word mission and, and, and purpose. For me, mission is the word that I, it's getting overused in my world. But I'm trying to change the word mission to outcomes and say, mm -hmm. look, the world, hold yourself accountable, not to your mission, but to the outcomes. And then work backward from the outcomes because you're not going to be achieving the outcomes. The outcomes are hard to achieve and you never get to 100% of your outcomes if you have any ambition mm -hmm. so then the question but but work backward from outcome as opposed to try to work forward from something that might be nebulous like purpose or mission i love that i love that and that's what they do at amazon you know i mean i think that one of the most remarkable things about that company is this whole idea of you know think five or six years into the future and then work backward and say well what would that look like you know how what are the steps i could take and then they really free people up uh, to to do that so, um, Hendrik von der Merwe, great point. <laughs> good, good pronunciation. Way to go. <laughs> and you comment on holding yourself accountable and what extreme boundaries might be considered. Well, I don't know about extreme boundaries because I'm, I'm a pretty conventional guy. I'm, I tend to play toward the middle of the, uh, the road. I, the no punk rock in my, in my, in my, in, in, in my background. But, 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 but I think this notion about holding yourself accountable is working backward. It's, 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 I mean, another word for outcomes is impact. It's like, you know, look, we don't have forever to make our contributions in the world. So it's like, and it, 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 by the way, you get to my age also, the word legacy starts showing up in your brain. Oh. So, so, so impact is another, is, is a code word for legacy if you're younger. Mm -hmm. But, but, <laughs> uh, but I think it's, I, I think those are the kind of things that, that matter because, because they could matter to other people, not just to you. If it, if it just, if it's just about you, God bless you, but, Nobody cares about you. I mean, your mom cares about you, but it, 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 you, you've got to find some way to, to align with other folks. And it can't, if you keep on trying to pursue your own personal advantage, the world finally figures out, well, you're in it for yourself. God bless you. Good luck. And mm -hmm. stay out of my way or I'll stay out of your way. Yeah. Yeah. And they, you know, people, people pretty quickly pick up on that. Yeah, they do. Which I think is a really good thing for people to remember, and I love this idea of in service. Of it's a good, it's a, just a really good reminder. So you're working with companies now on AI and how AI fits into this whole idea of generative GPT and how are they using it? What are the big questions that people are asking you? Well, the thing that's surprising is you know you and I have been through about you know well we heard about the World Wide Web. Well, have you heard about you know uh, the internet? Have you heard about mobile? Have you heard about? <laughs> I think that 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 the chat GPT generative AI is more disruptive than anything I've seen mm -hmm. in my lifetime from the point of view of the individual experience, not from the point of view of the impact it's gonna have on the world. But I've never ever seen a disruptive technology that was so inviting. Mm -hmm. Most disruptive technology, you have to pay a price to overcome the, the learning curve. This thing does. And 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 what it and I've never been, never worked with a technology before that surprised me. So every time I read, I thought, how the hell did they, feel? whoa. And, and, and so, so every, so everybody's had that experience this year. I mean, literally this, this wasn't around last year, at least no. I didn't, this year. 
Uh-huh. And now what I'm, oh, it's fun to watch is, so I'm spending time with Salesforce, Dreamforce is next. next ah. week. So Dreamforce is their Mac world. It's, it's their time to show the world all the cool stuff we're doing. Well, I don't know if you remember, but back at the end of last year, there was a big shareholder brouhaha about Salesforce and Elliot and Starwood and all these different companies were coming in and you guys have got to get your profitability. And you thought, whoa, we're going to have one of these, you know, productivity zone rules this year, right? Mm-hmm. And, and and God bless them. Mark did empower the productivity zone and they did start these initiatives. And by the way, they're making quite good progress. But two months into it, this chat thing comes out of nowhere. And all of a sudden it's like, and not but or or and we're going to revamp our entire product line by essentially overlaying this in. Now, to be fair, they had a ton of stuff on the shelf. I mean, God bless. They, they had, but still, I think what's exciting about it is this, all of a sudden, every engineer I know in software is going, I want, I want, I want to play again. I, I, I want to get into it and play. Uh-huh. And so that kind of energy, so the fact that it's so attractive to the end user and it's, it's so transformative to the end user you know, we did all this stuff about a user experience, but it was mostly point and click. It wasn't talk and listen. This is like, what? This this thing understands me better than my spouse. I mean, what's going on? <laughs> and, and, and so so that's the user experience. And then you're the, the programmer going, well, holy smoke, what can I do with this thing? Mm-hmm. And so I think we're, we're in the middle of a really exciting year and probably next few years are going to be pretty exciting. I think so, too. You know, and I mean, there's a lot of talk about the downsides, but so many upsides. I mean, I've played around with it. And and honest to goodness, you know, it for me, it just saves time. Like, I never would allow it to write for me or anything. But if I wanted to generate 12 ways AI is going to change the way that, you know, white collar work is done, it'll give me a decent list of 13 or 14 things, half of which are, you know, I would not really throw know. away. But, yeah. <laughs> and by the way, you and I are kind of at the margin of a lot of, of the, the, the average user's got a bunch of perfunctory work that they just have to get off of their plate. Exactly. That, 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 that frankly, these things can do as well, or perhaps even better. People oh. are scared that it's going to destroy jobs. And, and here's what I think is going to happen. Yes, the old jobs. Yes, yeah, th- that workload. That workload is going to go to this software, but but this is I mean this is Darwin. I mean you you have to adapt to changes in the environment. Do I think the world is going to run out of problems that need human attention? I don't think so. So therefore, I, but you have to move yourself to the efficient frontier of where human creativity is the right place to be, and and, and so I think it is going to be dislocating in the short term. I think protectionist actions in the short term are usually justified and in the long term they're disastrous. Mm-hmm. So, so you, you got to play that game. I, I, I want to take it seriously, um, but but I'm not, I mean, uh, come on, people. We're not going to have the Terminator. That's not, that's not what's going to happen. <laughs> I don't think the robots are coming for us yet. <laughs> but I had it. You know what I had to do for me that we it did a fantastic job. I had it write a press release. Yes. And it did a better job than some of the PR agencies I've worked with. And well, and who's more authentic? They, they, I mean, <laughs> you know, when you think about it, who in the agency writes the press release? They hand it to the intern. So Stephen Wolfram wrote a really good book on how chat GPT actually works. Uh-huh. It actually, it doesn't, it, it's, it's, it's all rhetoric. It's not logic. In other words, every word is turned into a number. Mm-hmm. So literally, when it's manipulating all this text, it, there's no there's no words and there's no semantics. It's literally just places, unique placeholders. So it, therefore, it's all rhetoric for me that the, the formation of words. And so what you get is the most popular rhetorical response to a logical question. Well, guess what? A press release is all rhetoric. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. <laughs> and, and by the way, unfortunately, sometimes job reviews also. I mean. Mm-hmm. I would hope that the performance review had a little bit more, but sometimes it. Well, maybe this gets us past that early learning curve and we get to something a little more meaningful. I mean, well, it, it, the efficient frontier of where we really need to show up and be human. I mean, we just have to show up. I mean, that's, there's no, you can't mail it in. Mm-hmm. I love that. I absolutely love that. Well, this has just flown by. Um, what, what an, Absolute pleasure to have you joining us. Um, so everybody, Jeff um, Moore, you can find him on LinkedIn. He writes these great 
regular articles that are very thought provoking and really, really interesting. Um, and I'd encourage you to follow him there. The link is uh, at the bottom of our display. And Jeff, till next time, we will talk. Well, thank you, Rita. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And thank you for sharing you know, your audience with me. I really enjoyed having the opportunity. Thanks so much. Thank you.